I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're very fortunate today to have as our guest a legend in Georgia politics, Mary Ann Summers. Welcome, Mary Ann. Thank you. Well, let's start in the very beginning. Okay. I was born and raised in the city limits of Atlanta. And when I was at the state capitol, they said I was the only one there that was. Everybody else was from somewhere else. Um, I had a great childhood growing up. I was fairly intelligent as far as making grades and got a couple of scholarships and but I'd graduated very young. My daddy wanted me to stay home a little while. So I'd be older, you know, could take better care of myself. So I stayed home. I sure did. Fell in love with a young man. And I really fell in love with him. And I wanted to be very close to him, very close. And I knew if I got that close, if God didn't get me, my grandmother would. <laughs> so I married him. Broke my daddy's heart. I was 17 years old, but that put, sort of put the quietness on my education. Everything else I just learned from living. Um, let's see. What happened then? I went to I was working for a retail credit company, which was the only job a nice girl could get in those days and be respectable, that of riches. And I, that was the only job application I ever filled out. And from there, <coughs> by one hook or crook or somebody I knew would call and offer me a job. I went um, to Delta Airlines. Mr. Woolman's daughter lived out at Niski Lake where I lived. And uh, she said her daddy needed somebody to help while his secretary was on vacation. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I worked for Mr. Woolman. And I mean to tell you if Delta couldn't land in Jackson, Mississippi, and there were passengers that were going there, he'd write them a letter. Or if they got out of the plane, it was raining, he was there with an umbrella. And he would come around, and I was pregnant, and he'd give us salt tablets it's in the summertime, because it was the only air condition we had was fans. And we made up quick reference, they have computers now, we made up quick reference books. They were long, skinny. On the front page we'd put the city and where you were going and all the flights that got there and all the connections. And at the bottom we'd put the other airlines in small print. We were full service. And if you want to come back, you turn the page over. <laughs> and um, Mr. Woolman offered me a Oh, and while I was there, um, we did the first millionaire vacation packages, and I helped with that. But anyway, Mr. Woolman opened, offered me a job, a full-time job, and I said, oh, no, Mr. Woolman, I'm not going to be working when this baby comes. I'm going to stay home and take care of him. Well, that baby is now 56 years old this year, and I, this is the first time I've stayed home and it's not time for me to take care of him. But um, after that, where did I go after that? My goodness. Oh, I went to the ordinary's office. The chief clerk was a patient of my daddy's and he called and he said, if you aren't doing anything, I need somebody. I was a roving clerk. I issued marriage license, I issued gun license, I issued liquor license, 
I sent people to Milledgeville. You know, at Follett, you got a gun license and a liquor license, and you had to go to Milledgeville or go to jail. And that was, that was a great job. But then uh, another neighbor had been doing some work with the women's programs at Southeastern Fair. And she said the general manager needed an assistant. Was I interested? Said it, you'd have to work seven days a week, most times, but the money's good. And you know, thirty dollars a month more than I was making was was better. And uh, so I went out there, and it was fun. Uh, when they brought the gold down from Delonica to put on the Capitol Dome, the mule train spent the night at the fairgrounds, um, all sorts of things. The one exhibit building, 35,000 feet, didn't show up, and the fair was going to start two days later, so I kept calling people, wound up talking to an admiral out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, got permission. He sent all these exhibits. And here they came from Lockheed and everywhere. And as I was going home five o'clock that morning, I had to get out of the way because there's this caravan of wonderful exhibit, wonderful exhibit. Um, Lakewood Rate Speedway was out there. And a uh, dirt track that's really well known in racing circles. I didn't know anything about racing. But I learned because I had to stay there and collect the money from the promoters for renting the track. And um, they don't say it in the formal history of NASCAR, but at that track, NASCAR was born. And um, we were, all our stock <coughs> was owned by the trust company. The land was on, it was non-profit stock. The land was owned by the city of Atlanta. And all these FHA and FAA, FFA, 4-H club, uh, they all, you know, that was a culmination. So I got to know people from all over the state. Um, the, the dean of the College of Agriculture was on our board. Bill Campbell was on our board, you know, and, and just lots of people. And it just sort of, I think today they call it networking. Back then we'd just talk, meeting friends and doing for friends. And uh, that we had a mayor's dinner every year and a governor's dinner and got to meet all those people. Um, oh, we even, I never will forget one time that somebody was exhibiting pigs or hogs, didn't like, said the, where they were was too damp. And I never will forget when I opened that letter across the top of it with the rear ends of 13 hogs. That was the way they judged them, so that was what they cared about. Um, and where did I go? Oh, oh, I quit the fairgrounds to have my son, who's now 40, a next son who's 48. That's how long ago it was. And um, Mr. Pappy said I had done so much, he paid me for five months after I left. Oh, got to know the, I know the monks wanted to have a exhibit there. They were so proud of it, I went down to see it. I said, it's awful. So they drove back and forth, and we finally got a good one. Uh, Carlin Dinkler was paying for that sponsor. Oh, and another thing, we had Crackertown Square, and we tried to put on a show, you know, every night, a free show. So me, not knowing you couldn't do it, I called and asked to borrow the Marine Corps Drum and Bugle Corps from Washington. and because we were going to have the Marine Corps Band in the parade. And uh, they lent them to me. And they came and we had these, this 
precision drill team throwing guns around. And the, um, and the band, that reminds me of something else. We had a fair parade the night before the fair opened every year. And it was big balloons and this, that, and the other. And it was always a success. A girl named Jean Hendricks from WSB called me. And she said, it's some anniversary of WSB TV. And we want to participate in the parade. I said, well, that's fine. So they participated and shared it for a long time. And that was what, where the 4th of July parade in Atlanta came from. That, that was the start of it. Mm -hmm. We quit ours and they moved to the 4th of July. And that's a big deal now. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you got involved in politics. Oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But all this is important because people that I met in, in these different things were people that, like when I was secretary to the members of the Senate, I knew where every county was and the senators thought, oh, she's smart. I wasn't smart, I was just, you know, from the fairgrounds. But um, I had Robert and I was down at the Capitol trying to get some, uh, something my husband was going to tech and I needed, he dead with old age, but he was going to tech. He waited till after he got out of the Navy. And I had, I needed some, something Xeroxed. Well, I ran in, I knew Richard Ashworth was there, <clears throat> and I ran in to use his Xerox machine. I'd gotten to know him when he come, he was, He'd been a reporter for the Atlanta papers, and he covered the courthouse when I was there. So I thought, Xerox machine. And I went in and Richard said, oh yes, you can use my Xerox machine, but it's gonna cost you. I need for you to help me for three days. I said, for what? He says, you know how I write, and I got, I'm loaded up with speeches and press releases, and um, I just need help. So I said I'd help him. This was Governor Vanderbilt's office. And I wound up staying through the Vanderbilt administration. And then Henry Neal, who was the Attorney General in the Governor's office, recommended that Governor Sanders hire me. So Doug Bernard hired me, and I never lost a day. And that was fun because that's when I met Bob Short. <laughs> now Bob Short, his chore was to go out to Miss Sanders' house and write a press release about her dress and what she was going to wear. The dress was beautiful, but she had three ostrich feathers in her headband. You remember that? I remember that. She did too. We talked with Miss Sanders. She remembered that. Oh, well, maybe I better not say yes, this. Yes, you must. You must say it. Well, Bob, I don't know how many press releases he wrote for her, but he said, I can't please her with those damn ostrich feathers. <laughs> so he said, told me to do it. He'd gone through all his staff nearby. I was the last resort. <laughs> well, I shoveled all the you-know-what that she wanted to shovel, and, and she accepted it. She was pleased with it. And um, that was sort of my kickoff in Governor Sanders' office. And I eventually became um, his correspondence. I, I opened all the letters that right. came to the governor, decided whether they should go to a typist or an aide for reply or go to the Revenue Department or wherever. And um, that, that was a good job. I liked it, except that was the year of the Democratic Convention. I've forgotten who all was in it. But the governor was taking two plane loads of Georgians. And he wanted, you know, all the publicity he could get. 
So this was when the airport was like the big Quonset hut. So he wanted a donkey out at the airport to see everybody off. Guess who had to get the donkey? So my husband and children and all, we got one. It was a Jack, when his name was LBJ. And he had a straw hat on. Well, Jack's this back of him's this tall, you know. You can't believe that donkey did not want to get on that trailer. It wasn't a horse trailer. It was, you know, get his legs up and push him up. So we got to the airport, pulled up right at the front door, got him off, started through the airport with him. George Bagby, whose legs were this long, wanted to get on him. So he got up on the back of him. And here we hauled the donkey through the airport, and I was so glad he did not <laughs> take a rest. But we got to the plane, a lot of fanfare, and all they all took up, took off. Now was stuck with that damn donkey. Had to get him back, you know, home. But uh, that was a success, and it was fun. And that was the year that uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And when he was assassinated, we got, were you still there? Mm -hmm. We got those reports that, you know, somebody was going to try to shoot the governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we just told everybody, all the girls, go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I was standing there when the thing came over. I've forgotten what you call it. It burned the message in the that said, you know, Kennedy's dead, LBJ is now the president, you know, everybody should give the National Guard and all should their faith to them. I mean their loyalty to them. So that was that was exciting for me. Um, and also I'd forgotten this somewhere. I've got a rough draft with Governor Vandiver's notes in it about, you know, when he decided to keep the schools open. And we went out to the mansion and took that draft and he made some corrections. And that was an exciting time in history for me. And oh, and another story about Governor Vandiver, when I first went into his office to go to work, for some reason, and I don't take shorthand, I only type hunt and peck, but I had to take notes on the commission buildings. So I got it all ready and I took it in and I was standing by the pull out thing on this desk and I handed it to him, you know, and I was just, I hope this is all right. And he read it and he looked at me and he said, uh, my dear, why did you put so-and-so in there? I said, well, Governor, I assume he put his hand on mine and looked over his glasses and he said, my dear, we don't assume anything. To assume something only makes an ass of you and me. <laughs> I've never used that word since unless I was telling that story. Um, but anyway, there was all sorts of exciting things and we always met everything that came along. And uh, came Christmas, 63. And Henry Neal, who was just so smart and such a horse's rear when he wanted to be. <laughs> he liked me and I, I came to love him, but he was real. Nothing gets in the way of his business. So I had talked him into letting his secretary and somebody go home for Christmas. And Garrett. And Garrett go home for Christmas. And he said, well, she can go if you promise you'll do any work I have to do. I said, I'll be glad to. Well, of course, on Christmas Eve, after we had our Christmas party, he had, to, had an extradition that must be done that minute. So I did it. Didn't get out of work till 5 or 5.30. 5 
my husband and the two boys were waiting on me. And we went up to Elder Riches and rode the pink pig. That was when it was from the sky and I was pregnant. Um, got our Christmas together, went home. Next morning had Santa Claus and at noon I had Donna. <laughs> she was almost two months early. And uh, so that, my career in the governor's office was, you know, ended at that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the man from the, that had been at the fair called me in a couple of months and wanted me to help do a don't lug it, let it ride, show it, agriculture thing, feeding and all, feeding animals. So I did. Oh, and over in Athens. And what did I do after that? Oh, in my spare time, I would always work, <coughs> not as a secretary of, but as a secretary to the members of the state senate. And when they were in session, uh, they, my desk was on the Senate floor in the back, and they brought one or two girls from the Revenue Department, and we did all the work those senators needed. They now have, I think, 39 secretaries. Um, but it, it, it was fun. Oh, there were a lot of things. I mean, we learned all about politics there. Um, including Roscoe Dean, who thought I was his personal secretary. He'd come up and he'd, and he'd always, Roscoe was right heavy, but he always brought, brought pants that were way too large and a belt this much too long. And he'd have his cigar in his mouth and he'd come up, he says, I got to have this done. I'd say, yes, Senator. He'd say, I'm working so hard and he'd pull that belt and gather his bridge. You know, look how much weight I've lost. <laughs> and uh, Roscoe wanted to write everybody in his uh, district. So we'd write them, and the stamps were on rolls, you know, and Roscoe would get them first place one place and then the other. And the only time I was having a political cartoon there was a drawing of me with my hand on my, like this, looking, and just re, I mean, lots and lots of rolls of stamps with them just all over the place. But um, Roscoe was all right. He did take a walk several times, so he wouldn't have to vote on something because his grandmother that raised him had died. And she died lots. <laughs> and. Um, there was another story about Roscoe. It was better than anything I've told you. It wasn't the Rowan speech, was it? Yes. Has anybody told you about no, that? Tell us about the Rowan speech. Okay. Roscoe sat between Bobby Rowan and Frank Eldridge. And he was, uh, and they, he deviled them, but boy, they got back at him. And he'd say, I got I to gotta have speech. I got to have speech. And so they'd say, well, no, I got to have a speech. So this went on so much that they finally said, okay, we'll write you one. So they wrote him a speech. He said, you, you got to hurry. I got to go to the well of the Senate tomorrow. Must have been that thick. <laughs> and it started off and he read it, and he opened it, and it said, pause for applause. <laughs> and there was not another word in that whole thing of paper. <laughs> he, there was, I mean, he just went, mm -hmm. <laughs> And another thing, you might have to edit this out. Another thing about Roscoe, after I went to work for the Senate full time, it was sort of a half, floor that was right above the men the men's restroom. Well on that half floor I had a 
office with conference tables and all that. And sometimes the senators, when they were plotting things, would want to use my office. So this particular day, um, Joe Kennedy and I don't know how many said, man, we need your office. And well, I had locked it. I said, okay. So I go running up the steps. I could run then. Joe Kennedy's right behind me. Joe Kennedy was tall and big. And uh, I opened the door and it's, they're coming up. And I slammed it back. Well, they just like dominoes or something. Joe Kennedy hit me in the next room, the next room. They all tumbled down. What'd you do that for? I said, you don't want to see that. Yes, I do. And he threw the door open. And Dr. Somebody from down in, around there, Jessica, somebody that was in the house was giving Roscoe a shot of penicillin. And he was leaning over the conference table with his drawers dropped down around his ankles. <laughs> if you think that wasn't a sight. <laughs> but Roscoe, Roscoe was all right. He, he really wanted to serve his constituency. And he, he did. And let's see. Oh, Oliver Bateman. Oliver Bateman was one of my senators, and he was from Macon. Republican senators. Oh, yeah, and we didn't have it two Republican senators then. So on my desk, I turned their work over here when the Democrats came up to it. And when they came up, I'd turn <laughs> their work over because I didn't, you know, trade stories back and forth. And I was working so hard, and they were voting on something. And after it was over, Senator Bateman came up and he said, Man, I'm so sorry I couldn't vote for your bill. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know, the bill on the Commission on the Status of Women. He said, I couldn't vote for it. And I looked at him and I said, Senator, when I have to depend on a piece of legislation to get what I want out of a man, don't vote on it. Bury me. <laughs> And um, what other thing? Kyle Yancey. I used to sit down by his Senate desk in his garbage can <laughs> and take his notes. And that went well till one day somebody pushed through and I fell over. And, you know, I said, I can't do that anymore. Oh, and the, uh, we, uh, they had established the uh, Tourism Committee. And this was about the time that Stone Mountain was getting geared up to do things. and Everybody wanted money for their district, you know, from the state. I know that was about the time that they numbered the exits so you could give people directions, you know, how to get somewhere. That was a big deal. And um, Stone Mountain wanted money. So we went out to visit Stone Mountain, and they were good to me. They didn't have to take any notes. I took them all. So we went out and we visited Stone Mountain, and um, it was Ford Spinks, Al Minish, me, I've forgotten who else. Guess where we went? We went up on the car then. There was a, a elevator from the base of the car and straight up. And then there was some sort of walk that like had bomber flooring in it with holes in it. You go into the mountain and you come back out over the scaffolding. So there I was in a blue silk dress and high heels, the wind blowing. And Dr. Minish is holding onto the rail with a cigar in his mouth and he says, this is a hell of a place to find out you got acrophobia or whatever it is. <laughs> and, um, but it was fun. And, and my grandchildren, I think, took pictures of that that I had. You know, how many people can say their grandmother had been up on the face of the carving at Stone Mountain? 
with a dress on. Um, I also, the tourism committee took me to Savannah and they, were, they wanted some help in starting to redo Savannah. And I never will forget, there was this one wonderful house and the people said it was for sale for $1,900. And I told them, I said, somebody buy it. This is going to be big. Nobody bought it. But that house is worth about $2 million now, you know, over the years. Nobody ever took my advice. <laughs> um, let's see. Then what happened? Oh, I left out Charles Weltner. Yeah. Charles Weltner, Charles Longstreet Weltner. Oh, he was a great guy. He, um, and when he died, he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Georgia. But I can remember when he had his midlife crisis and came riding down Peachtree Street on a motorbike with a helmet and his briefcase in his hand. <laughs> But um, Charles called me right after somebody was born. I guess right after Donna was born. She was born Christmas Day of 63. Charles was going to run for Congress, and he wanted me to come be the hired help in his campaign. Now, not the big official campaign manager, but, you know, run this campaign for and I told him, I said, I don't know a thing about campaigning. And he said, my God, five years as a carny and three years for two governors ought to qualify you for something. So that's how I got involved with Charles Weltner. And that was, that was great. We worked really hard. I didn't know I knew how to make so many signs and things like that. And, uh, that was a time, 64 was a time of a lot of movement, the civil rights thing. And we had some very good supporters that were very active in that. We had some very good supporters that were not active at all, didn't approve of it. But uh, met a lot of interesting people. That's when I first met Andrew Young. And um, anyway, the Civil Rights Bill comes up, it's either September or October of that year, and the vote is, you know, it's getting time to vote on it. Well, Charles, it had to be, I could, because it was before November election. So Charles came home one weekend. Robert, get that, please. Um, Y'all, I'm so sorry. Um, here, here, Robert, you can have this phone. I meant to cut this off. Would you hand it to him, please? Make sure it doesn't ring again, please, honey. Um, we had this meeting of the campaign staff and his advisors and his AA in Washington, from Washington and Sal Craig, who later on. Sally Craig. Yes, we called her Sal. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, handled all the prisoners from Cuba. Yeah. She was, became director of some part of the, whatever they called it then. Um, and we were all sitting around the room, the back warehouse room, and all the Blinds were closed because you did not campaign on Sunday back then. And Charles told us about this vote was coming up. And he said, I, I want to know what y'all think about it. Well, he started around the room and he wasn't getting a whole lot of help. Jerry Horton said, it'll be, Jerry was his AA then, administrative assistant. Jerry said, it'll be your death now. And they got around, and I, I saw Charles was not real happy, and he got to me, and 
I said, well, Charles, I don't know what I can do, but if you got the guts to vote for it, I got the guts to work for you. <laughs> so he went back to Washington, and the day before the vote, I, I called and to ask about something, and I asked Jerry, I said, where's Charles? Jerry says, I don't know, I guess he's in the Garden of Gethsemane <laughs> praying about this. <laughs> and um, Charles voted for it. Uh, we were all very proud of him. Of course, his vote didn't really count because it was down to the W's when he voted, and by then it had had passed. And uh, but he he was proud of it. He was very proud of it. And uh, I don't know where Jerry went after that. I don't remember. But all of a sudden, Charles was without an administrative assistant. So he kept saying, well, I don't know what we're going to do. And because the election was coming up, and he wouldn't, I mean, if he was going to stay in Congress, he'd know in two or three months. And he couldn't ask somebody just to come be my A, stop what you're doing, come be my AA for a couple of months. So he said, well, we, we got to find somebody. And Larry Lloyd's uncle or something, a retired military man, said he knew somebody. So we talked to him, Charles said, we're going to hire him. He said, but I don't know if he knows where the front door is in Washington. Mm -hmm. said, you and Sal Craig got to edu educate him quick. Well, we did. Bless his heart, his name was White Fowler. And... Um, he, he stayed with Charles, and then Charles, I don't remember exactly when it was. It had to be the next election. I don't know. Anyway, to, but it right, wasn't right in the election. Anyway, the Democratic, State Democratic Committee came out with a loyalty oath you had to sign, and in it you had to agree to be support all the members on the ticket, and Lester Maddox was on the ticket. And Charles said, I'm not supporting Lester Maddox. So we talked to him, and he said, I cannot support Lester Maddox. So he dropped out of the race. Bingo. And I think Fletcher Thompson was elected in his place. And. Um, Fletch offered my oldest son a scholarship to different military academies. I thought that was nice of him since I tried to wipe him out. <laughs> um, anyway, after the Civil Rights Bill was passed, it became somewhere between that day and March. Um, I guess it was January, the Georgia House re a portion. And as soon as the session was, and they had called for special elections in March of 65, as soon as the legislature was over in 65, um, and I had come in, I think that might have been the day, um, what's his name, hung over the banister and stopped the clock. Um, Denmark, Denmark Grover, who was a member of the uh, the, the flying the flying tigers, no. one of those groups that black black squadron. But yeah, yeah, and uh, I even went to a couple of their meetings in Atlanta. Denmark was something else. Anyway, I digress, which I do all the time. The night the session was over. I drug in the house, I fell across the end of the sofa, and the phone rang. It was Leon Eplin. And Leon says, Marianne, I'm glad I got you. We got another race. Right. He'd worked with me and Charles, so he's a great guy. He says, we got another race. And I've told him you'd do it. I said, Leon, there's not enough money in the world to make me take on another political campaign. He held the phone and said, he said, Elliot, come talk to her. I told you she'd do it. <laughs> and that's the way I got involved with 
and it led us. So of course I did it. And uh, as a matter of fact, his wife Babs was pregnant with Kevin, who is now a member of the Georgia House. Um, so I kept it in the family for 40 something years. And um, that was good. I, I had some experiences there. And it was determined. He, he was a Jew. And he was determined that wasn't going to hold him back. He's going to make those people take it. Dick Thibodeau, J.C. Rary, who was head of the Masons, mm -hmm. and Elliot were the three people in this non, what, nonpartisan. Nonpartisan, yeah. Special election. Yeah, special election mm -hmm. held in because March. Because of reapportionment. Yeah, because mm -hmm. of reapportionment. So we got us a campaign headquarters on West Ponce de Leon. It's now a vacuum store, I think. It's just two little storefronts and set up business. Well, different things happened. I can't remember the boy who was political editor of the Constitution. I don't know his name. But he would stop by there on his way home at night because I was there by myself a lot and he just thought that wasn't good. And he stopped by there one night he, I think he brought me some supper and I was busy and the phone rang. And this man says, you ought not to be working for that GD Jew. You know, you're a white girl. You better get out of there because we gone do something about it. Well, I hung up on them. They called again. And by that red, Reg, um, Reg Murphy? No. Greg Favre? No. Anyway, he says, man, don't you think you ought to leave? He said, I think I ought to leave. I said, just sit down, drink your Coca-Cola. And I went back doing my work. They called again. And I said, do not call me again. Hung up. They called the third time. They were going to bomb the place. I said, if you're going to bomb the place, go ahead and do it. I don't have time to mess with you. <laughs> and I hung up, scared him to death. Of course, they didn't come bomb it. You know, they were just, but there were lots of doors sprayed yellow, and, and, and anti-Semitism was bad. I think it's worse now, but it was bad then. And. Um, Another thing we did was uh, Elliot was going to a Klan meeting. I said, no, you aren't. He said, yes, I am. He was on the second story of somewhere. It was dark, and I said, oh, God, we're going to get killed. He said, you just wait for me. He went up those steps, opened that door, and said, hello, I'm Elliot Levitas. I'm running for the Georgia House, and they went around shaking hands. I hope I can count on your vote. They were all sitting there like that. <laughs> and, um, but he got elected. And the whole 10 years he was in the Georgia House, he was elected, he was named one of the 10 most valuable leg legislators in the House. And of the night, the night of the election, he and Babs went home, and I called him to tell him to come on down. He'd won the election. And he said, I told you not to get excited. I hadn't won that election. He said, you know, I probably won't even be in the runoff. I said, Elliot, there's not going to be a runoff, and you have won. He said, you just wait till Midway comes in. I said, Midway's in. And you carried it. And he said, oh my God, they don't know what they've done. <laughs> but then he went to the legislature. And um, he was really good. Of course, some people might not think this is good, 
But if it wasn't at Fayette at Levitas, it wouldn't be a MARTA system in Atlanta. Um, he also started cleaning up the Chattahoochee River um, and did all sorts of wonderful things that I'm sure he probably told you about. But um, he, somewhere along there, two or three terms, Tom Murphy decided he wanted to run for Speaker of the House. And Elliot had been toying with it, and he had been gathering support. And the long and the short of it was that he stepped aside so Tom wouldn't have any real, you know, anybody really against him. And uh, Tom appreciated that. And from that day forward, every time we had a campaign rally or campaign opening or a party, Tom Murphy was there. He even, after I got sick, he even started calling me, just check on me. <laughs> but he, no matter what anybody says about Tom Murphy, he was a smart man and a good man. And uh, then we went to Congress. And that was DeKalb in Rockdale counties, wasn't it? Yeah. And it, the seat had been held by Judge Davis. Yeah, James C. Davis. From Stone Mountain. Who, who owned most of the property the Klan met on. Did you know that? <laughs> um, but then he decided to run for Congress. <coughs> now, something happened between that, but I can't remember it. Oh, well, if I think of it, I'll come back to it. Um, Congress. We, we started running for Congress. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, I gotta go back one thing. When was Zell elected Lieutenant Governor the first time? 74. Okay, this was about that time. Um, there were two people in this world that I would be loyal to come hell or high water. And one of them was Elle Miller, and one of them was Edith Levitas. So, this is 74. Max Cleland, who was one of our constituents in DeKalb County, called and said, man, I'm gonna run for Lieutenant Governor. And I want you to help me. I said, well, you know, I'll do what I can, but, well that, on December the 29th, 1973, Zell took me to lunch. I, I was in the First National Bank Middle somewhere. He took me to lunch. And he said he was going to run for Lieutenant Governor. I said, crap. I said, Max Cleveland's going to run. He said, I know it. I said, have you talked to him? He said, no. I said, you got to tell him. He said, you call. And, but before that, I said, when he said he was going to run for Lieutenant Governor, I said, Zell, this is the first time since I've known you that you've had a real paying job. <laughs> you know, you were head the Board of Corrections and now you're on pardon and parole. And I said, they pay money. Shirley doesn't have to work day and night and you don't have to borrow money on the trailers. You know, it's, you got a real job. He says, I'm going to be Lieutenant Governor. I thought, oh, Lord, here we go again. Well, he was. But anyway, I called Max and told him that he was going to run for lieutenant governor and, you know, that I, I had to be loyal to him. And um, that started another adventure. Um, can we stop a minute?
Okay, where was I? Going to Gainesville to help Zell Miller. Um, we, he found us a rickety little house trailer on um, Lake Lanier. I think it was on James Mathis' property. And we started campaigning. And he worked so hard and we didn't have any money. And we would drive over the mountain. We'd take Shirley and the two boys and Zell and me and my children. I had a great big old burgundy station wagon. We'd pile them all in, drive across the mountain to Miss Birdie's, eat everything we could find and bring home everything that wasn't nailed down to eat the next week till we could go back. I almost got slender that, that summer. Um, but that, you know, that was a campaign like all campaigns. But, uh, well, there were two things about it. That was where I found out about country music. Um, so I'll need to talk to Bill Anderson, who was very popular in country music. He was doing a show in Greenville, South Carolina. And he said he needed to talk to me too. Would I ride up there with him? I said, sure. So we get to Greenville and we go to Bill's bus and Bill's letting us on the back of the bus. And so I said, sit down and talk to this woman. You'll like her. It was Jan Howard who sang with Bill at that time. And um, Jan had been married to Harlan Howard and you know, all these big country music names. And I sat down and talked to, him, to her and we liked each other. And she's been one of my best friends ever since, sung at all our weddings and funerals and everything. And uh, she, uh, she's the one that called me and wanted me to go somewhere with her for a few days because she was so tired in Nashville. I told her I couldn't go. She said, yes, you can. She told me where we were going. I said, I'll meet you in Miami this afternoon, but I'll have to buy me some clean drawers and a toothbrush. We went to Jamaica to John and June Carter Cash's home called Cinnamon Hill. It was the ancestral home of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. It was up on a cliff overlooking the water, and, and that was, uh, that was great. That was an experience I'll never forget. But I got to, through her and different things, I knew a, a lot of people. I think one of the most exciting phone calls I ever got, the phone rang and this voice is, this is John. And I thought, oh. Um, <laughs> and that, uh, but anyway, that, Zell wanted to talk to Bill about Bill coming to the Ninth District and them doing a series of pick up little shows on one Saturday all around. I know we went to Commerce and somewhere and Bill and the Poe Boys would play and it'd attract a crowd and, Ze crowd and Zell would talk about politics and we'd go on off to the next one. And the one place we couldn't go was Blairsville. Somebody was going to fly us up there or something. And, uh, but the weather was so bad we couldn't go. We couldn't go to Blairsville. So we had to make plans to go back on a later Saturday. So we called. Remember, money was very tight. We called. Bill did that for free. But we called and found a couple that were only way from Jacksonville, Nashville, and they didn't really have any money, but they said this girl could sing. And we um, um, said, you know, good, we can pay our hundred dollars, something like that. And so she came and we put on a barbecue around the courthouse in uh, Blairsville and trying to keep the politicians we liked with us and ones we didn't like, we wanted them to go somewhere else. And um, the, I was working, trying to make sure there's enough food and enough this, and this one wasn't shooting that one. Zell says, 
come listen to this woman. She can sing. And I looked at her. She had on a black, like, rayon dress. It was all, you know, stringing down and black with roses or something. And the roots were this long. She was blonde, but the roots were this long. I said, okay. So I walked around there to listen to her. And that girl could sing. She and her brother, I'm not sure it was her brother, but God, that girl could sing. And Zell gave her a check for $100, and she took it straight to the bank to Shirley to get it cashed. <laughs> and her name was Tammy Wynette. <laughs> and um, so, you know, to be an illiterate that didn't have any education, I don't say my career, but my life has had some interest in you know, directions. Okay, and also that campaign was when I found out about money and power and politics. Zell had gotten the endorsement of the Forsyth County paper, of several of them. And Mr. Landrum's money man came through the week. The endorsements were coming out on Tuesday for the election the next Tuesday, and the money man hit the ninth district. And he had his briefcase, and he'd go to this newspaper, and he'd say, let's see, your district wants blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, Mr. Landrum can't arrange for that if he's not in office. And he, he knocked out some, I never will forget Forsyth County, the man that was head of some of the Masons or somebody, he was such a supporter of Zell's, and they hit him. And he called and he said, we can't do it. We can't endorse Zell. And of course, I ripped and snorted. And, but that showed me the depth. Of, I mean, all my politics had been fun and work. You know, if you worked hard, you did that. But that showed me the black cloud that lies over so many, you know, Elliot always told me that the art of politics was the art of compromise, that you had to give in order to get. And, uh, but that man, he didn't want to, he just wanted to either, you don't get it if you give it. So that, that was a hard lesson for me to learn, but I never, I never ever forgot it. And uh, Zell lost by a very small margin. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, it was this something I could have done, you know, that make up, that, that was that some dead folks are going to vote it or something. <laughs> but bless his heart, Shirley and, and I were there the election night, and we were at our headquarters at the Dixie Hunt Hotel in Gainesville. And I believe if we'd been higher than the second floor, Zell would have jumped. <laughs> It was a hard, they had put everything they had into it. And it was a real. Including an endorsement from Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten about that. Um, but that was hard on them, and, and it, you know, financially and every other way. And um, I guess that was, that, that was when he went to work for Board of Corrections and pardon and paroles and then like, decided to run for Lieutenant Governor. Yes. I don't know if I got that mixed uh, up yes, chronologically he ran, he ran a while ago. Congress in uh, 64 and then again in 66. Yeah. Two races. And I, oh, I had something I was going to show you that I keep clipped on my calendar book. It uh, is a little card about that big dark blue red writing on it, let Zell Miller represent you and a picture of Zell with that burr marine haircut and I was going to show that to you it was from that race and uh, let's see after that what happened how far have we gotten well we're now at the point where Georgia's very historical governor's race that nobody won and the legislature had to 
the side. Bo Calloway and Lester Maddox. And when it went to the legend, and Peter Zach Gear did a magnificent job. Poor Zach, Zach had some of Bill Clinton's problems, but <laughs> you know, he, he, oh, he was magnificent. He was so smart. If he just used it, he could have been God. But um, Elliot voted for Maddox. And I said, what have you done? He said, I had to vote the way my constituents wanted me to vote. And um, it was almost like Charles voting for the Civil Rights Bill. Um, but you know, I talked to some black folks, and now they're Afro-Americans, but I talked to some that we had a lot of confidence in, and I said, what, what happened to these people? Why did Maddox get so many votes? Because he got, you know, a barn full of black votes. That's what put him where he was. And they said, well, you know, one old man especially, he said, Little Missy, he said, we know what Lester Maddox is going to do. He said, you know, he does help folks that need it. Said he talks ugly and carries a big stick, but he does do some good and he helps folks. He said, but we don't know nothing about that, Mr. Uh, Callaway. Callaway. We don't know nothing about Mr. Callaway and all his money and his, you know, and, and that made perfect sense to me. I, I guess. I would have to call Lester Maddox a populist, just like George Wallace. Mm -hmm. You know, they both ran their mouths, but they did help poor people. Mm -hmm. Might not let them eat in your restaurant, but they, they did help them keep a roof over their head and be able to eat Paschal or something. Um, and after that, I don't know what I did. About time for to go to Washington. It, but well, oh, Zell got elected in I mean, Elliot got elected in '74. Mm -hmm. That was it. Yeah. And um, off he went to Congress. Well, I went with him to, you know, be briefed and pick out an office and all that. And Elliot said, and you don't can't believe how many supporters want to come to the swearing in because this was a big deal. This is another time a young Jewish man from the deep south elected to the Congress. That, that was big time. So we made plans and we used John Flint's office, you know, to do things and work out of so we could get an office. And um, Elliot says, well, all, I said, we got to do something for all these people that are coming, you know, for your swearing in. Well, I understand, he says, that you can uh, use these big conference rooms and all, you know, and we'll have wine and we'll have this. Now, just prior to that, Ben Blackburn had been scorched for serving alcohol at some something in the capital. And we defeated him. And uh, so you never, you just didn't tell Elliot, you can't do that. Because that was just lighting a rocket. So I said, well, that, that sounds good. I said, I can see the headlines now. New congressman sworn in with wine and liquor party. You know, and, and, and I'd call the room that Ben had used. I said, I can see that now. He said, all right. He said, do whatever you want to. So I took it to the Democratic National Club. <coughs> and it worked out really well. But um, Elliot was a real mover and shaker in Congress. 
he, uh, I made me some notes on this envelope. He got Marta some more money. Jim Wright came down here and inspected all of it, came a day early. And we had to edit one of him here. He went back in town and so we had to, we got him on Marta that wasn't even, we could only go on on orange crates certain distance. And, and the airport. And it got <coughs> the money for the new airport, not the brand new, but the one first one after the. And he was on um, public works and transportation. And he was on the FAA oversight committee. And he was chairman of buildings and grounds and something else. But he, um, and this isn't in the right order, but Union Station was falling in in Washington. He got that, you know, pushed that through the restoration and the money. The pension building, I don't know if you're familiar with the pension building, it's the prettiest building in Washington. It's where the uh, people from the North, the, what do you call those folks that fought for the North? Not the, <laughs> the Union troop, that's where they go to sign up yeah, for their pension. Yeah, that's where they go to sign up for his pension. And sometimes you'd see it when they had that program from Washington about Christmas and the building with the big, huge car. And it always said if he ever got elected president, that's where he wanted to be, you know. And then there was um, the Snake House at the zoo. See, that was a federal building, so there was something snaky, sneaky about that Snake House. <laughs> but it rattled on, and, and he took credit for that, and I said, you better not take credit for that. We just found out it was an FBI scam thing, you know. Um, the Chattahoochee. Andy tries to take all the credit for the Chattahoochee, but mm, that was Elliot's baby. We even, we would even inspect the Chattahoochee. All our staff, now we'd get these rubber boats and we'd go down the Chattahoochee. And you haven't lived until you've seen Elliot Levitas in a Speedo. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, and we'd all eat barbecue. Um, let's see. That was, oh, oh, this was something he did. Elliot went to the Far East with a congressman from California, I can't remember his name. When he got there, there were all those things going on in Lebanon, you know, everybody's bombing everybody. They wanted Edit to meet with Arafat, who was the head of the PLO, who was causing a lot of this. And Edit wouldn't meet with them. So I can't read my notes of what I did about it, but it's Israeli invade, Israel invaded Lebanon to get to the PLO, and Tip O'Neill had set up this. Anyway, long and short of it, Eddie wouldn't meet with them. So he's coming home, and all these things happen with that situation. Well, Elliot's already on board a transatlantic flight. And Ted Koppel is calling, and this one's calling, and that one's calling. Am I talking too long? No, not at all. And I said, we got to do something about this. He can't be blindsided by all these people. Well, the plane was going to land in Boston. So I got Mary Jane Norville, who's working out in our Washington office. I said, Mary Jane, there's a plane to Boston such and such a time. Get your butt on that plane. And I called the folks at Eastern and said she was coming. And they got something to meet her. And they were able to get on the plane before anybody deplaned. 
She brought him up to snuff on that. When Elliot got off the plane, he spoke with such authority and, well, I know so and so and so and so and we expect this and this and this. And um, he was on Good Morning America and Ted Koppel's Nightline and I always loved to go with him to those places. Elliot didn't drive anywhere back then. Um, we went over to Ted Koppel and I got to sit in the green room and eat all the goodies while they were on the on television. But he was um, he was always doing things like that. And he was a member of the North Atlantic Assembly, which was the parliamentary arm of NATO. And he was always going over and doing that. One time he was doing that, he and Babs were over there. And um, Kevin got sick. Kevin was 14, 15 years old. And the lady that was babysitting had worked for them for a hundred years. And she caught up, she said, man, I don't know what to do. Kevin's sick, he's mighty sick. And I said, okay, get so-and-so, take him to the hospital. And they did, and they, you know, about to have a ruptured appendix, or, but they wouldn't op, and Dr. Lebedis, his brother, I had him meet him, they would not operate on that child unless he had the parents' permission. I said, you're gonna let him die? Well, Babs and Elliot were in Portugal, and they were spending the night at the American Embassy. But the phones in Portugal back then cut off at 10 o'clock. So I couldn't get to Elliot and Babs. So I was I went to this little church in DC and one of the people in the church was a brigadier general with the Marine Corps. So I got him out of bed. And I said, I got to get to that you know, Marines guard the embassy, right? So he made some calls and pretty soon I was connect they he said they had a radio or a phone in the guard shack. So I got that, got Elliot on the phone, got him hooked up with somebody at Emory, you know, all these phone lines, go, and they said, he said, for God's sakes, operate on my son. You know, she can sign it. So they did, and that turned out all right. But you know, you, those are things that's sort of out of the ordinary for a secretary to have to do. <laughs> and uh, another thing that, that Elliot did on his, one of his overseas trips, you know, when all the Baptist dissidents were taking shelter in the Russian, in the American embassy in Russia, you remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, Elliot and Pete, somebody from California, they go to the embassy and they visit with these people. They had, they had to be in Russia for something, but they, while they're there, they go to the embassy. And they visit with them a long time, and they go to catch their plane. So Pete, you know, is, when they go to get on the plane, I mean, he's everything but strip searched. And he goes to get, and they didn't do that to Elliot, because Elliot's a Jew. What truck would he have with Baptist dissident? He said, thank you very much, appreciate it. He got on the airplane. When he got off, he must have had a hundred letters pinned in his coat, and, you know, that he smuggled out of Russia to their, fa not a hundred, but to friends and family so they'd know where they were and, you know, didn't bother him a bit. He thought that was great. And um, one time he, when he was first up there, I, I've lost my time frame again, EPA was causing a lot of trouble. And, Super fun. Yeah, and Gorsuch was head of it. And uh, Rita Lavelle was her number one person that was dealing with the Superfund. So, 
they aren't cooperating. So Elliot's going to talk to the President of the United States and get their cooperation. So he could, you know, they'd call back and they'd say, well, Mr. Leviticus, the President can't do it today, but, you know, Elliot said, I want him to come, finally said, I want him to come to my office. So I never expected him to do that, but Jim Mikroszewski, you know, who's now the Pentagon person for NBC, he and some other folks sat in the car outside our office over the weekend. It was snowing, and lived off our Georgia peanuts and Coca-Colas. Mm -hmm. And they called, and they, that White House called, and they said, um, well, the president can see Mr. Levitas such and such a time but I'm sure he can't get down here in the snow. I said, we'll take it. <laughs> so there's snow on the ground. So Elliot, I call Pat Epps, and Elliot goes out to the airport, and Pat takes off. He found out they could land at Dobbins. I'm not Dobbins, Dulles. So I get the uh, sergeant at arms who had a black, something like you've got, and chains, and we go to the airport, Dulles, to pick up Elliot. Uh, Epps is finally able to land. We get in the car, we haul back, the White House is. Well, we hadn't heard from you, so I'm sure Mr. Levitas can't make the meeting. I said, yes, he can. He's just waiting to hear from you. We were all panting like this. <laughs> the long and the short of that was Rita Lavelle came and talked to him in our office after that and then testified before his committee and wound up in jail because she lied to the committee. And. Um, that, that was an exciting weekend. And you never, you know, things don't just happen. Whatever you see happening on television, oh, wasn't that, and I mean, there's all sorts of people scurrying around to make those kind of things happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then there were, there were some funny things. After Elliot's last campaign, when he didn't campaign, I had an MS exacerbation in Washington, and I had to spend a lot of time at uh, the hospital up on the hill, Capitol Hill Hospital. And there at the foot of my bed, looking out this tall window, there against the navy blue sky of Washington at night, which is, really is navy blue, was the dome of the Capitol, all lit up. It's just like a picture. And I wasn't there but two or three days before I realized, that even though I wasn't going to be there anymore, that dome had not tilted. I wasn't going to be over there helping do the things I did. It's like taking your hand out of a bucket of water. Well, that was what, looking at that dome, you know, it just had not tilted. Well, Mr. H.G. Patillo had wanted Pat Swindle, I think, to offer me a job. Of course, I couldn't have done that. But anyway, after this, 10 hours one night, here comes Swindle. My room's dark, but I'm looking at him. And he comes in, he said, I'm Pat Swindle. I said, oh dear. <laughs> and so he goes to get some water, and he's standing on my bed, by my bed right here. And he's talking to me. About that time, I hear two sets of footsteps, and I knew who it was. It was Elliot Levitas and his daughter. And Elliot walks in my hospital room, he says, hello. And he looks at Swindle, and Swindle looks at him. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> and they spoke. And they reached across my bed, across me, and shook hands. And I thought, you know, that was 
I mean, to me, that was a big, big something. But uh, Eddie came back home, went to kill Patrick Cody. And, I, you know, that, that a case of all the American Indians wanting the money they hadn't had in a thousand years, he's the lead counsel on it. Let's talk for a minute about that campaign, uh, uh, his, his last campaign. Uh, Pat Swindle was a young uh, guy, crook, who ran for Congress, and it was a very <clears throat> bitter, wasn't it, campaign? Elliot wasn't really bitter. Elliot just wouldn't do anything. But uh, Pat did all sorts of ugly things. Every time Pat ran for office, he got his wife pregnant, so he'd have, you know, all these kids. And um, I knew a lot about Pat from a cousin over in Anniston that he used to sleep in the back of his daddy's store. Pat had a hard life growing up, and maybe he didn't know right from wrong. But uh, I found out that Pat had been arrested for DUI on Brockcliffe Road in DeKalb County. And I found it out because the man that was the, not the DA, the next one, um, the one that handled those kind of cases called and said, man, I got something you need on Pat Swindle. And it wouldn't use it. Um, I, I knew somebody that had walked in on him on a very compromising situation. And it wouldn't use it. Um, and it is as fair and honest a man as I've ever known in my life. Been lots of rumors about him for lots of different things, but I'll stand up for him from now until hell freezes over. Do you remember a guy named Rob Austin who managed the Swindle campaign? No, I've tried to forget all about them. <laughs> well, that's understandable. If I ask you to describe Elliot Levitas in one word, what would you say? Well, the first word that comes to mind is brilliant, but there's got to be a better word, like um, outstanding is not good enough. He's just uh, the best there is. I mean, he's, he's honest. He's, and like one reason he was so popular in the Georgia General Assembly, something would come up and he would explain to these South Georgia boys that you aren't looking far enough. He would see the ramifications on and on and on. And sometimes they'd want him to help write a bill and he would do it. And he's just absolutely, My vocabulary is not good enough to find the right word. And I'll defend him now. I might cuss him out. I threw a telephone at him one time and, and hit the frame of the door and it, it dented the door in the government building and he said, my, 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 I wonder if GSA is going to come after you. <laughs> and that was all he said. One time I was driving him somewhere, rainy and car came out of the side and ran into a broadside and tore up his car and all our food looked like I had, was bleeding, you know, we had barbecue. And uh, you know what he said? He didn't say, what the hell did you do that for? He looked, he said, are you all right? I said, yes. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah. He said, stay here, I'll handle this. Been me, I'd been hitting somebody in the head for doing that. But he, um, he's just an exceptional person. If I ask you to describe Zell Miller in one word, what would you say? About the same thing. Except he's a mountain boy and Zell's a, I mean, Elliot's a flatlander. But uh, Zell is, bless his heart, he, I think Zell is so 
honest, it, sometimes it, it hurts. But I think he'll stand by his word till you ought to know that. What, uh, in your recollection, is your fondest memory of politics? I don't, I can't answer that. There are too many of them. You knew Ellis Arnold. Oh, yeah. Governor Arnold, Elliot was in Governor Arnold's firm, and he got elected to Congress. And, and uh, I had made friends with Governor Arnold when, you know, he was in the firm. He'd call up and he'd say, Mary, Come down here and let's go up on top of that big building and he we go up on top first nation by. And I'd say, he says, I need somebody to talk to. And I'd say, Well you got lots of people to talk. He says, Yeah, but they always say, Yes, Governor, and you're right, Governor, nobody ever argue with me and you argue with me. <laughs> so I was one day I was in his office and he was crawling with a train on the floor with one of my children and he offered me a job. He was going to run against Ernest Vandiver. And I said, Governor Arnold, I can't, I can't work for you in that race. He says, why not? I pay you good. I said, yeah, but I might have learned some things from or about Governor Vandiver that I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'd be disloyal to him and I'd be disloyal to you if I didn't tell you. And I said the same things reverse. I said, I, I just can't do it. Well, he appreciated that. And the next thing he said, he said, uh, I wanna give you some money. I said, for what? He says, I want you to go and buy some of those pointy-toed shoes that women wear. I said, for what? He says, well, Eddie's going to get to Washington, and he's going to be two feet off the ground, and somebody needs to kick him in the ass regularly to keep his feet on the ground. <laughs> I said, I can take care of that. You don't have to buy me any shoes. Um, but, the, you know, and going to Washington, Ah, there was a little church next door to me, Christ Church. I was raised a Baptist, and, and uh, the bells would go off, and I think, oh God, I might as well get up his, and go to church, just try to listen to it, you know, try to sleep through this. And I got involved in that little church, and it came to mean so much to me. As a matter of fact, I became senior warden in a little Episcopal church. And um, the, the rector, the day the bishop was coming to do whatever he did, to, he says, you know, man, I don't believe we have a copy of your letter. I said, no, you don't. He said, well, you can't be a you know, senior warden if you aren't a member. I said. Well, you ain't getting my letter from Claremont Hills Baptist. If I move my letter, my grandmother would spin in her grave. He said, well, I guess we can, we can handle that. So the bishop came, and everybody lined up, and in the Episcopal Church, they pat you on the cheek or something, you know, to trans all the power. He got to me, and he's black. John Walker's black. And he slapped me. And then he slapped me again. So we had breakfast between services. At, I said, Bishop Walker, how come you slapped me twice? He said, I was trying to slap the Baptist out of you. <laughs> so anywhere, anytime we went anywhere, and he was, he'd say, wait a minute, where's my Baptist buddy? My backsliding Baptist buddy. And I always got, I, I did a lot of things. I got real active in that, and it meant a whole lot to me. 
and I, we called, I was on the call committee to call a new priest who's now about to be a bishop. But he came and he brought all his, you know, paraphernalia about how qualified he was and this, and his wife came and we must have interviewed 30 people. I kept going back to this one. And um, we called him and he accepted. But he'll never get over the fact that when I announced it to the congregation, I stood up and the thing went, the place went hold, but about 100 people. It was the oldest continuously occupied public building in the federal city. And uh, we moved in the new sanctuary in 1805. But anyway, I stood up and I said, I have an announcement to make. And I said that Bob Tate was going to come be our new rector. And I said, there are lots of things I can tell you about and you can read all the qualifications. But I said, the reason I wanted him because he was just like sweet cream, rose right to the top. <laughs> well, the bishop said, I heard what you said about sweet cream. And uh, I said, yep. And he said, I guess you can let the organist play one of your songs. John Philip Sousa had been the choir master in that little church. And they always played these Sousa marches. And, but on Easter, they'd play up from the grave he arose for me. <laughs> so that would be my, my, my song. But I loved it. Well, you met a lot of interesting people. Oh, I did. And people I see on television now, Henry Waxman and Dean Rusk, you know, I don't tell, but all those people. I, I know one time my oldest son, uh, seventh, eighth grade, um, his civics teacher said, now this is what they're going to do. And my son's hand went up and he said, no, ma'am. She said, oh, yes, the Secretary of State is going to do this. He said, no, ma'am. And she thought he was being ugly. And he said, no, ma'am, said, last Friday night, I had dinner with Dean Rusk at Congressman Ms. Levitis' house, and he said so and so and so and so. <laughs> <coughs> My children campaigned for sale. No, Donna gave out more balloons, and but you know, it was just all family. I had a little blue Mustang in 19, the first year and I sold it to Zell for $500, and his two sons totaled it. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, they were just always family to me. As a matter of fact, I wanted to show you something. Um, there's two or three pictures over here somewhere. And then there's a bigger one with a, yeah. It's not supposed to be, oh, close it and open it. This is my cell phone. Thank you. This is, I'm, I've got a picture wall I'm gonna put up someday. You recognize any of those people? Well. Levitan, there's Elliot. There. Kitty Jacobs, who's heads up the breast yeah. cancer uh, thing. And uh, I don't know who this is. Oh, he became head of the Democrat Party, I think. Can't remember his name. You know this guy. That's Zell Miller. says that you are a brilliant political operator. Operative. Operative, yes. Well, he doesn't write very well. No. He 
he certainly wasn't. What else does he say? He says, to Marianne, an able aide, a brilliant political operative, my love, and a ding. Ding bat. Ding bat. <laughs> I treasure that. Yeah, that's nice. And this, when Elliot went to Congress, he had four of these made. One for his mother, one for his wife, one for Miles Alexander, and one for me. Mm -hmm. And then look at the note he put on the back of it. That's his first official paper. You may ask, with love, Alpha to Omega, Elliot. That's nice. Um, and that's, you asked me what I, my favorite things in politics were that all that sort of sums it up. Well, you've had a very interesting life. You contributed very much to the political climate of Georgia. And we thank you very much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me.